and and when, and when the Pixar artists and animators employees, um, you know, wrote that letter, yeah, you know, stating that you know they were being censored, yep. that that was a huge ramping up of the whole situation, in, in my huge. opinion. I mean, that that really ramped up the whole the. It, it, it went from like uh, it, it, it went from like you know twenty miles an hour to sixty miles an hour because now you have Pixar piling on, and it was really not a good look. And and Alia, you did mention now the Variety article I think you shared mentioned that they did mention Iger in regards to that censorship, right? With Pixar, mm -hmm. they and, said so, so. Keep in mind, Iger was CEO. He acquired the company, and then he was CEO until recently in December, and so. The majority of what the output of production from Pixar came from his leadership. So when Pixar says executives told them to censor this or censor that, that was Iger. So Variety was not letting him off the hook. That that's yeah. interesting, and that's fair. That's fair, and that, mm -hmm. and it's interesting fair. that it is fair because you know, look, we have to place accountability where it lies. I mean, the reality of the situation is Chapek has only been there for two years. Um, most of the movies being released right now have been in production before he even took over. So it was fair, I think, for Variety to acknowledge that fact that a lot of these films that were being censored, you know, were under Iger's tenure, right? I mean, and, and I think that's, that, that's, that's a fair point to point out. Now, I want to ask you, Alia, in terms of the censorship of the Pixar films, do you feel it's kind of um, Disney is just not ready yet to kind of go all out with the LGBTQT thing in their animated films? Or do you think there's other factors at play here as to why they're kind of pulling back and censoring? Um, I think it was from, I don't think it was from the, the big picture, goodwill, humanity side. I think it was from, business, unfortunately. They were, thinking, they were thinking of Russia box office, Chinese box office. Yeah. And so we're seeing what, the, what China is doing now with limiting the box office. I hope that's a wake up call for all the studios that you know China should be bonus. And well, so the production budgets and the content, the creative content should just be for most of worldwide except China and Russia. And then their bonus, if Russia ever opens up box office, there's the whole economic issue now, but um, with the foreign governments and their, that decision, but China and Russia should be seen as bonus. Things should not be planned for either of them. But at the time when those movies were in production in Greenland, that's what those executives were thinking of. We don't want to lose right. Russia and China. It, well, right. and I would also include, I would also include the Middle East in that conversation as well. Yes, I mean, yes, they were, yes, they were, that's true. That's right. True. <laughs> and they, they were trying to, they were trying to you know, have these things be wide in distribution. And it's, it's, you make compromises when you do that because of, you know, cultural differences, of course. But this is why, this is why, you know, I have criticized Iger in the past about his attempting to placate China in the way that he did, in attempting to, 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 to so to speak, get in bed with them in the way that he did with Shanghai Disneyland. I think he had a notion that, Hey, if I just play ball, if I if I if we build this park out here, it'll put us on a, a, a even better footing than maybe some of the other studios, right? And they'll and 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 if we capitulate to their demands, we'll get access to their box office because they only get like maybe like fifteen films a year from the American box office, so they're very choosy on who are they're going to let in. And he, you know, he 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 wanted that market. Right. And that was the that was the carrot that they dangled in front of him. And now he's come to recognize that that was maybe a mistake. He had a recent interview with, I think it was CNBC in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, interestingly enough, uh, right on the kind of eve of when he was, uh, you know, officially retiring. And he admitted that he's like, yeah, my my optimism about China has soured in uh, so to speak. Right. And, and I think he's come to recognize that that was maybe a mistake. But now, you know, I mean, that's always going to be something that people are going to hold over your head when it comes to these uh, kind of decisions. And it's going to be interesting and fascinating to see how the company pivots uh, either away or, or through those kind of issues. Uh, we saw uh, with Eternals how they were pretty firm. They were like, hey, you know what? We're going to release this. If we get banned, we get banned. Uh, and, uh, you know, y y you got to give them uh, you know, credit for, you know, <laughs> sticking to their guns, so to speak. Right. But but now, I mean, this is, 
you know, this, this, like we were saying before, OG, JPEG has played, I think, the business and corporate world, uh, you know, the, the, the corporate arena very effectively to yeah. get to where he is, right? But the social and cultural world is completely different. Yeah. Yep. You play by an entirely different set of rules. And yep. he has to recognize that. And unfortunately, in this case, uh, he, 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 I don't think he did. I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an example here. And you you hit the nail on the head, Dre, right, with that. I mean, here's the thing. You can be the most business minded, smart, intellectually great, you know, whatever CEO, right? But if you don't have that social, th those social skills and that, and that kind of people, those people skills and that PR thing, um, it, it, it kind of makes all of the rest of it kind of moot, really. I mean, look, I work with, and I'm not calling anyone out, okay, on my <laughs> nine to five job. I work a regular nine to five job. And there are a couple people that they're, they're, by the their their work is by the book they rarely make mistakes with their work itself right but they have a lot of like personality issues with you know a lot they they, they, they come off kind of hostile and give a lot of attitude towards clients and what have you right that's a problem. You can do by the book, by the letter, perfect work. But if you don't have the people skills and you're making your clients upset, you're pretty much dead in the water. You might as well not even have the perfect work at that point. And that's kind of how I feel about Chapek. He might be great in terms of the financials. He might be great in terms of Wall Street. He might be great with business strategy and what have you. But he has no clue. He's completely oblivious to the public relations end of this job. And that is his Achilles heel. He has got to get, if he's going to stay on as CEO, which I'm actually not even sure if that's even going to happen anymore. I don't even know. But if he's going to stay on as CEO, he's got to get that in order because that will be the reason why he ends up getting getting fired. The, the board, there, there comes a point where no matter how good your, your quarters are, if the board feels you're a liability and you're in the headlines every week for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. you're out of there. They don't mm -hmm. want to deal with that. They'd rather get someone like Peter Rice who can provide the same quarterly results and not be a problem in the headlines every week.